Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 1.4 on the separation of a mixture. Uh, as the title suggests, today we're going to learn about how to separate mixtures, both homogeneous and heterogeneous, into the pure substances that they are composed of. My guess is that you already know how to separate mixtures, so most of today's lesson is going to be about uh, just giving you some terminology to use to describe the techniques that are being applied. Let's take a look at the do now. You've got sand, rubbing alcohol, oil, and water, and you've mixed them together. Design a procedure that will enable you to separate the mixture into its components. Uh, just in case you're not aware, rubbing alcohol is soluble or dissolves in water. When you go to the drugstore and you pick up rubbing alcohol, um, it's a mixture of both rubbing alcohol and water. Okay, so pause the video, see if you can figure this out. Let's take a look at what we've got. Sand, rubbing alcohol, oil, and water are mixed together. So let's picture that in a beaker. Um, our sand is most likely going to, if we give it a chance to settle, sink to the bottom. Then on top of that, we'll have our water and our alcohol, our rubbing alcohol. And then on top of that, we're going to have oil floating. Um, so let's see how we could separate this. In class today, people suggested first scooping out the oil. So like an arrow, we'll just write scoop. You could use a spoon or a ladle or something, and you could just simply skim the oil off the top and put it in a separate container. And then you'd be left with just your oops, water and alcohol mixture and the sand sitting at the bottom. Uh, from there, we got the suggestion to um, like use a screen or a strainer, some way to filter out the sand. We can collect the sand on the screen, and that's going to leave us just a homogeneous mixture of the water and the alcohol. Um, finally, and this is a little bit more complicated to separate, some people had the idea of heating or boiling the mixture. Water and rubbing alcohol have different boiling points. Water, as you're probably familiar with, has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. Alcohols usually have boiling points more in the like 70 degrees Celsius range. So if we heat this up, we're going to reach 70 degrees first before we hit 100. So we'll be able to drive off all of the alcohol and leave us just with water sitting in our beaker. Um, so if you can figure that out, you already have a pretty good idea of how to separate mixtures. Again, today we're just going to introduce you to some terminology and equipment to make you sound a little bit more scientific. All right, uh, so let's look at another example of separating a mixture. Let's say you've got this big pile of coins and you want to separate them into quarters, nickels, pennies, and dimes. You could accomplish this a variety of ways. Uh, you could make a freshman go through and put them in piles for you. You might have something like a coin sorter at home that'll do this for you automatically. Um, maybe you can separate it based on the size of the coin or the mass of the coin. Um, regardless of how you choose to separate this mixture, it's key to take note of the fact that mixtures are physically combined, therefore we use physical techniques to separate them. All of the techniques we use today for lack of a better way to explain it, don't involve chemistry. We're not running any sort of chemical reaction, no chemical change is taking place, we're not creating new substances, we're just using different physical properties to separate out the components of a mixture. All right, so let's get into some of the different pieces of equipment that we would use to do this. Uh, first, we've got this apparatus, which is called a filtration funnel. Uh, based on the picture, hopefully you can see that we've got some solid sitting in the bottom of this beaker, and then we've got some sort of liquid on top of it. So filtration funnels are used to separate solids and liquids. The idea is, as you pour your sample out of the beaker, it's going to, uh, the liquid's going to pass through, and your solid gets caught in the filter paper. So solids cannot pass through the filter paper. Um, it's worth pointing out that the mixture needs to be heterogeneous. In other words, you have to be able to see the solid in the liquid. Uh, so something like sand and water, a filtration funnel is a good tool to use to separate them. Uh, on the other hand, if you take salt and you dissolve it in water and you pass that through a filtration funnel, you're going to end up with salty water in your collection beaker. Uh, if salts or whatever substance you're working with dissolves in water to form a homogeneous mixture, a filtration funnel is not going to be the appropriate tool to separate them.
Up next, we have this apparatus. And just to give you a little bit more information, um, you've got like a clear liquid, and you've got kind of, I guess, a purplish brown liquid as a lower layer. Uh, this is called a separatory funnel. And this is going to be an instrument that separates liquids based on density and polarity. Uh, density we talked about in the last lesson, so hopefully you're familiar with that concept. Uh, polarity you might not know just yet. We'll be talking about it more later in the semester. Um, but to give you an example that you're probably familiar with, oil and water have different polarities. You know from experience that oil and water do not mix. Um, so substances that don't mix have opposite polarities. And you're going to see that split like we've got in the picture of the separatory funnel with the less dense liquid floating on top of the more dense liquid. Um, this is going to work if the liquids do not mix with one another. So if we think back to the example that we used in the do now, we can separate the oil and the water and alcohol. The oil can be separated using a SEP funnel. Um, the water and the alcohol, because they mix or dissolve in one another, this would not be an appropriate choice. Again, the mixture has to be heterogeneous, just like it was with the filtration funnel. And the way this works is just kind of a fancy way to scoop out one of the liquids. You would turn this little nozzle um, and the bottom layer is going to drain out. You can control the speed by how much, a, how wide the nozzle is open. Um, and you can trap the remainder of the liquid uh, up in the, in the separatory funnel. All right. In this setup, we've got a hot plate, a source of heat. And in this section right here, um, we usually have cold water coming in and then here we attach a tube so the cold water can come out. So that kind of bubbled area of the apparatus is cold. As you can imagine that we're going to heat up a substance on the hot plate, it's going to boil and then the gas can kind of make its way down, condense and then recollect in the other round bottom flask. This is known as a distillation apparatus and it is going to separate liquids based on boiling point. So for the do now, we came up with the idea of heating the mixture of rubbing alcohol and water. Um, if we wanted to collect the rubbing alcohol and not just let it boil off into the atmosphere, we'd need to use a distillation apparatus. Uh, this will work if the liquids dissolve in one another. We can use this for homogeneous mixtures. Um, you can also use this to separate salt and water. Um, I probably wouldn't use a distillation apparatus in particular just because it's not good to heat the glassware to dryness, but you can use the same technique. If you've got a mixture of salt and water, you can heat it up in something like an evaporating dish. Um, you can drive off the water and the salt is going to be left behind. Put a star in your workbook over those three different separation techniques, the filtration funnel, separatory funnel and distillation apparatus. Those are the three that we use most commonly at this level of chemistry. There are a couple other separation techniques that I'd like to talk about. Uh, hopefully this one is a no-brainer. This is a magnet, which of course attracts magnetic materials. Um, this apparatus or piece of equipment, um, oftentimes students think of this more as a biologist tool, not so much used for a chemist, but in reality we use them too. Uh, it's called a centrifuge and it's going to separate solids and liquids. Uh, the way it works is the substances in the centrifuge um, are going to get spun around at really, really high speeds and it's able to separate them based on different densities. Um, a lot of times when people think about centrifuges, they think about separating the components of blood. Uh, if you think about what's in blood, you've got water, white blood cells, red, uh, red blood cells, plasma, platelets, a lot of very, very small, teeny tiny solid materials. Uh, not to be gross, but if you try to pass blood through a filtration funnel, um, you're probably not going to be able to separate out those incredibly small components. That's when a centrifuge would be useful. So again, we're going to spin those samples really quickly, separate them by density, and it's used when the solids are extremely small. Again, think on the order of platelets and like red and white blood cells, extremely, extremely tiny. Um, in the past, I've had students kind of treat the centrifuge or the idea of the centrifuge like it's this magic machine where you can throw any mixture into it and it just automatically separates it for you. That's not what a, sep uh, sorry, what a centrifuge does. So be careful. Um, the answer to every question on how to, center, uh, how to separate this is not simply use the centrifuge. This is just one technique that serves one very specific function.
All right, last but not least, we have an advanced separation technique known as chromatography. And this is something that we will not ever touch in high school. Um, I didn't do it until much later in college. This is a very advanced separation technique. Just to talk a little bit about what's going on in that picture before we get into a definition, um, you've got a, an ink sample most likely, and a high quality black ink is actually composed of red, yellow, and blue inks. Uh, so that picture all the way to the left, um, you're loading the sample, in other words, you're pouring the black ink into what's called a column. And it says step one, elute. That basically means just add more solvent or add more liquid. And as the black ink makes its way through the column, you can see that it's starting to separate out into the different colors that it is composed of. So chromatography separates substances based on their attraction to the material in the column. I know you can copy that down, but it probably doesn't have too much meaning for you at this moment in time. Um, this is going to work well for homogeneous mixtures. Uh, before we move on, I want to take a little bit of time to try to describe what this bullet point means. And I want you to pretend that we're at school and you're at one end of the hallway and I'm at the other and I'm waiting for you to come to me. Um, if that hallway is packed with your friends, uh, people that you like spending time with, you like hanging out with, it's probably going to take you a long time to walk through the hallway. You're going to stop to talk to people. Um, because you are interested in what they have to say, you know them, it's going to take you a while to make your way down the hallway. Um, on the other hand, we've got that same scenario, but instead of packing the hallway with your friends, we pack them with complete random total strangers. It's gonna take you a little bit of time to move through the column or the hallway uh, because there are people in your way, but you're not going to have any real interest in talking to anyone. You don't know them, so you're gonna make your way through relatively quickly. Uh, things that are attracted to what's in the column or another way you can think of it is interested in what is in the column, tend to hang out in the column for a long time. Uh, whereas substances that aren't really interested in the material that has been put in the column makes its way through much more quickly. So if you take a look at the different color inks that are being eluded, uh, the blue ink is most attracted to the material in the column. It's the last one to come out, so it took the longest time, where the yellow ink is not particularly attracted to or interested in what is in the column, and it came out relatively quickly. So now that we know all the different separation techniques, um, I want you to tell me if this is possible. I've got a beaker of water, I'm going to put it in my distillation apparatus, and I'm going to end up with oxygen and hydrogen diatomic elements. Is this something that we can do with our separation techniques? Uh, hopefully you know that no, this is absolutely impossible, simply not going to happen. All the separation techniques that we've talked about today use physical changes and physical properties to separate out the components of a mixture. If you want to take a compound, something like water, and you want to break it apart into its elements or even break it down into simpler molecules, you have to use chemical techniques. In other words, you're going to have to run chemical reactions. All of the techniques we talked about today will not be able to do this. We're going to be able to separate substances in a mixture based on things like phase of matter, boiling point, polarity, density, uh, but we could not separate compounds into elements. Just simply something that the techniques and apparatuses we learned about today are incapable of doing. To wrap up, I'd like you to design a separation technique. Um, so let's say we give you salt, sand, and iron filings. And what iron filings are, you can kind of think about it as like a dust made out of iron. Um, so Tell me how you're going to separate it and be able to explain the reasoning behind each step of the procedure. So pause the video um, and see if you can figure this out. Feel free to get creative. So you've got your salt, sand, and iron filings, and you need to separate them. Uh, these are all solids, and if they're all mixed together, um, they're going to be a little bit of a challenge to separate. Uh, hopefully it goes without saying that you don't want to sit there with a magnifying glass and tweezers removing them um, by hand. That's a real waste of your time. 
Uh, hopefully you came up with the idea that if you use a magnet, you can very quickly pull out the iron filings. Iron is magnetic where salt and sand are not. So a magnet will attract the iron and leave the salt and sand behind. Um, to separate the salt and the sand, you've got to get creative. Uh, you're probably going to want to add water to this mixture so that you can get the salt to dissolve and uh, the sand is not going to dissolve. Once you've got that salt, sand, and water mixture, um, hopefully it's pretty straightforward how to separate it from there. Pass that mixture through a filtration funnel. The sand will get stuck on the filter paper. The salt water will pass through. And then we can heat up the mixture of salt and water. We could use a distillation apparatus. Again, for safety reasons, you probably don't want to heat a distillation apparatus to dryness. But if you wrote that down, you're completely fine. You've got the right idea. Heat up that mixture, force the water to evaporate, and the salt is going to be left behind. Uh, so that wraps up our lesson on different separation techniques. Hopefully you uh, kind of figured out that you already know how to separate most of the mixtures and you just have to work on learning the terminology.